Good morning, everyone. It's good to have all of you with us today, and especially those of you who are visiting. But it's real exciting for me to tell you this morning that Alan Swore is with us. We're excited that Alan is with us. He has been homebound for years, and uh, we're just so glad that he's been here. But I want to tell you why he's here. The sun is shining. And he is in a wheelchair that can drive him all the way here. So he drove his wheelchair for miles to come worship with you. So thank the Lord for people like Alan Swore. It's also good to see the Wells with us who are visiting with us. It's good to see the Hargroves visiting with us as well, especially Ross, my young man that was in my cabin a long time ago and watching what a great young man he's grown up to be. And so proud to have him with us today. But I have an announcement I want to share about John Banks. We were able to see him this past week. And the family's statement is that he has gotten to a state that hospice has been called. The family is taking it day by day. So remember John, Reagan, and Axel and their families in your prayers. Maybe you have childhood memories, as I do, of growing up going to church, as we say. I grew up worshiping with a church that met in a large, austere building of mammoth proportions, sitting upon hard and well-lacquered pews that had been there when I was born for over or close to four decades, still so polished that I remember one Sunday morning the polyester of everyone's Sunday's finest making an unforgettable sound as everyone rotated to turn around one Sunday morning when a visitor protested the words of the speaker. Life-changing moments that you can remember from your childhood. Like also when your mom gives you a pre-ripped half piece of double mint gum and you realize that when you put it in your mouth that it tastes like perfume and purse dirt. Still, there is something that connects those memories. My parents were planting trees. There is a sampling of this idea where Nelson Henderson, a Canadian farmer, is credited with saying, according to the Huffington Post, the true meaning of life is to plant trees under whose shade you do not expect to sit. Gordon Hinckley, who attributes his statement to a Greek proverb, says, A society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. End quote. And Tom Bendranath Tagore, who in 1913 became the first non-European to win the Nobel Prize in literature, is credited to say, the one who plants trees, knowing that he will never sit in their shade, has at least started to understand the meaning of life. Integrity, honor, courage, and faith are the cornerstones of a life well lived. And the men that said these things, that we have attributed to them, the question is always who said it first and who cares? But the three statements all come together to make us realize that our job is to plant for the next generation to come. To recognize that in every single act we perform, we are giving an example of how to find meaning and happiness, not just in our own lives, but to exemplify it to those who will benefit from it. And so we began this year focusing our attention on worship so that we would truly see worship in the presence of God. We talked about the beginning of worship, the why are we here anyway, and the applications of fasting. But today we want to address the legacy of worship. What tree are you planting? 
Truth is universal. It needs to be shared and repeated as often as possible. And so when Henderson, who perhaps read the quote from Tagore, he changed it up and made it meaningful to, so that he could express to his family, because the story is, I read it on the internet, so it must be true, is that Nelson Henderson, who is credited as this Canadian farmer to say this, when his nephew, grandnephew, found out that it had been attributed to him, but then he read it in the writings of Tagore, he wrote Huffington Post and told them they needed to change the credit because the source was Tagore and not his great uncle. The question is, is it true? The meaning of life is found in the shade of wisdom that's been left for, to us by those who precede us. And so the question is, what sort of plant, what sort of tree are you planting? Look in Psalm 78. A mascal of Asaph. Asaph was one, uh, this is one of 12 mascals that Asaph wrote. And he was a minister to the temple as a Levite. And he says in verse 1, listen to my people to my instruction, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. That they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart, but whose spirit was not faithful to God. And so on in the mascal, this teaching psalm is the history that Israel needed to be reminded of. But when David recaptured the Ark of the Covenant and returned it to Jerusalem, it says in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16, that the Levites, according to David's command, appointed Asaph to sound the joys, uh, sorry, to raise the sound of joy on his symbol. Later on, Asaph was elevated from symbol player to chief musician. And David commissioned him to be among those who would minister and worship regularly in the tent of meeting to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord according to chapter 16, verse 5. So when David assembled all the musicians to worship in the tent of meeting, he chose some who were the sons of Asaph. I want you to catch that. Asaph had been a cymbal player who was raised to chief musician and then laid in David's life when he's assembling everything together in 1 Chronicles chapter 25 for what the worship was to be. He chose the sons of Asaph because Asaph was planting a tree. Planting a tree that he would not benefit from its shade, but his sons would. Now that expression, sons of Asaph, perhaps is a relationship to describe his blood relatives. Although most people think that that expression are those like we would think of the word disciples, the disciples of Asaph, those that Asaph trained to lead in worship. But the point remains the same. That Asaph was planting a tree that he knew he could not experience the shade of for the rest of his life. But that his sons and those who he would experience that instruction with and teach 
they would share in that shade. So Asaph and his son served so faithfully that when Solomon begins to put into place the worship of the temple that God allowed him to build, Solomon chose the sons of Asaph to lead the worship. Asaph was dead and gone. But the tree that he had planted, his children were able to sit in its shade. Asaph took a small part before his usefulness became evident to David. Nothing is said that Asaph was ambitious. Nothing is said that Asaph knocked other people down so he could play the symbol. But instead, he taught people, perhaps his sons, to pass on to them the next generation of his experience, to give to others what that experience was so that he didn't know, he didn't have on his radar that 100 years later, King Jehoshaphat would pray for protection against the invading armies and receive a prophetic word given by Jehaziel. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 14. One of the sons of Asaph. Then 140 years, even after that, when Hezekiah was king, the sons of Asaph were among the Levites who cleansed and consecrated the temple to worship to God. So that the restoration of worship would be what it was supposed to be. Then, another 80 years later, in 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 15, after their great apostasy and the book of, law was found, the book of the law was found in the wall during the reign of the young king Josiah, and they put into place to celebrate the Passover again, the singers were the descendants of Asaph. 2 Chronicles 35, verse 15. And I could go on. But Asaph was purposeful and intentional that the tree that he would plant and the shade in which the next generation would sit would be a glory to God. And notice Asaph's masculine in Psalm 78 that we've read. Says, we will not conceal this from the children. We will teach them to the children, verse 5, that those children will rise and tell their children. So that in verse 7, they should put their confidence in God. And not forget the work God has done. But instead keep every commandment God has given. God is good and his steadfast love endures forever. So moms and dads, every time you demonstrate to your child. When you choose to come to worship while undone homework sits on the kitchen table, when it could have been planned and finished on a Saturday or a Sunday night, you're planting a tree. And you're passing on to the next generation that God matters more. In the silent example and not the profundity of your words. When you quiet their voices and silence them when they are talking while the prayer leader is leading or the communion leader is remembering or the preacher is preaching, you are teaching your own legacy that God is to be revered. Act on that today because every time you let it pass just this once, you're creating a legacy of just this once. And friends and family, Every time you choose to worship instead of going to birthday parties or going on vacation, you're generating a legacy. You're planting a tree.
that your children will one day sit in the shade of? How seriously do we take the command to tell the coming generations what we know of God and worshiping him? How many of our thoughts about music and worship revolve about what we like, what we prefer, what what interests us and what we find appealing? How often is that attitude passed on to the next generation who then focus on what appeals to them? It is an irony. That churches separate their meetings for different musical tastes. The progressive or the modern or whatever you want to call that worship. In the short run, it may bring more people to the congregation to worship, but in the long run, it keeps us stuck in the mindset that musical styles have more power to divide us than the gospel has to unite us. When we realize that the shade that will grow up in the next generation will be a reflection of the tree that we have planted. Are you only going to sing the songs I let you? Are you going to only sing the songs I like? Or are we going to do everything that we do to worship God? One person wrote, if we aren't careful, we become guilty of chronological narcissism. That views our generation and the music that we sang as the most important one. As Winston Churchill said, the further back you can look, the further forward you can see. But another lesson comes to mind in this story of Asaph when you go to 1 Chronicles 13. Look there with me. David has become king. Saul has died. The people have yielded to him. And now he's trying to start to unite the nation by bringing the ark that has been taken away from the temple or from, I'm sorry, the tabernacle in the city, the city and returned back to where it should be. And I want you to notice verse 5. So David assembled all Israel together from the Shihor of Egypt, even to the entrance of Hamath, to bring the ark of God from Kirith-Jerim. And David and all Israel went up to Bala, that is Kirith-Jerim, which belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, the Lord who is enthroned above the cherubim where his name is called. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab and Uzzah in Ohio. Ohio, sorry. Drove the cart. And David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, even with songs and with lyres, harps, tambourines, cymbals, and trumpets. But when they came to the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark because the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, so he struck down, so he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. And he called that place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How can I bring the ark of God home to me? So David did not take the ark with him to the city of David, but took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And thus the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the family of Obed-Edom with all that he had. And chapter 15 then says, verse 1, Now David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared the place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. And David said, No one is to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For the Lord chose them to carry the ark of God and to minister to him forever. God had made very clear the instruction about the ark and its relationship to the Israelites. 
In Numbers chapter 4, verse 15, after Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, and when the camp is ready to move, the Kohathites are to come to do the carrying, but they must not touch the holy things or they will die. The Kohathites are to carry those things that are in the tent of meeting. No matter how innocently it was done, touching the ark was in direct violation of God's law. Notice also that David took his men to collect the ark. He did not even gather the priests. He did not even gather any of the Levites. He did not even think of the holiness of the event of his action. Bringing the ark back to the place where his people could worship. That was a great mistake. And upon it, he built a cart. It doesn't even matter if the cart was old or whether it was new. We love to make it. It preaches really good to call it the new cart. But any cart was wrong. Because the staves of wood were to be run through the sides on the rings that were already pre-prepared for it. And it would be carried. The failure to do God's instructions would be not reverencing God. Having such an attitude of independence that would border on rebellion and disobedience. In that act, David was planting a tree. And in his act of planting that tree, Uzzah dies. Now, when we talk about that, we, it is such a graphic and, and horrific experience when we read that. But the text will tell us, as it's paralleled also in 2 Samuel chapter 6, that the ark had been in Abinadab's house. Remember, his sons, Abinadab's sons, were Uzzah and Ohio. So here in your house, you're growing up, and your dad has the ark of the covenant sitting in the living room. And Uzzah reached up to touch it when it's being carried on the cart to stay it. Maybe we could perhaps say that it was reverent on his part. He wanted to protect it, and that's perhaps true. But his father planted the wrong tree. Uzzah's father should have told his sons every day that that ark is sitting in their living room, that ark is not supposed to be here. That ark is supposed to be in the place where all of God's people can worship. And you are never to touch that ark. Jonadab failed. And his son paid the price. Because his father didn't plant the tree for his son to live in the shade the way it should have been. And notice when we read the account, it tells us that the oxen stumble. The ark didn't fail or fall. The cart didn't fall or fail. It's just that it wasn't done the way God needed to be honored in. And when Job asks his friends in Job 11 verse 7, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Or as Isaiah would say, his understanding no one can fathom. Or as the psalmist says in Psalm 145 verse 3, his greatness no one can fathom. David was planting trees. The father of Uzzah, Abinadab, was planting trees. And the shade that Abinadab's son Uzzah grew up in led to his death. And maybe the shade that David planted led to the death of his own son Absalom. Who knows? But what we do know is that something of this transcendence about God's presence is lost on us. In the time of Moses, the people knew the awesomeness of God's absolute holiness because of all that he did among them. They had witnessed the great miracles when they began as a nation. And every parent, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6, 
were to tell their children over and over again, not ritually, not annually, not habitually, but expressively, that this is the God I love. That this is the God that I adore. This is the God that I respect. This is the God who is awesome. And this is the God of our family. They had witnessed great miracles when the ark was with them. They saw how the ark blessed the house of Obed-Edom. And the more that we try to bring God back to the way that we think or reason, the further away he will always seem. Uzzah forgot that. David forgot that. But David learned and said, no one is to carry the ark of God but the Levites. So what kind of tree are you planting? You may never feel its shade. But what kind of tree are you planting? You're building a legacy of worship. That God is to be revealed, revered. You're building a legacy of worship. That God is to be obeyed. And you're building the legacy of worship. That God is the God I adore and that I worship. If you're a Christian this morning and you need us to pray with you, please let us know. But if you're not a Christian this morning and you know the words of Jesus who says, he who's believed and has been baptized, we'd be happy to make you his child by your act of faith and the transforming power of his blood as together we stand and as we sing.